The Great Turkey Walk by Kathleen Carr, Chapter 17. My tar turkeys walked into Denver in high style the next morning. It was more as if they was doing a prancing kind of dance, really. They lifted their skinny, shiny brown claws, or their shiny brown claws high, and set them down again with rhythm. All the whiles, they was bobbing their tiny purple red heads and shifting their bright eyes right and left at the sights. Waddles, jiggling with excitement, gobbling and clicking to high heaven. I was that proud of them, with the brilliant sun glancing off their sharp beaks and gleaming feathers that I sort of danced alongside. And why not? Why shouldn't we all be proud? They was fulfilling their turkey destiny. They might end up as roasts soon, but they'd be the f most famous turkey roasts ever. I'd done what I'd set out to do, too. I hardly noticed the folks at Denver lying in the streets and cheering in high good humor as if we was a parade, as if we was important. I was so caught up in the accomplishment. There was Mr. Peace sitting high and purposeful on the wagon, urging Sparky and his brothers into a kind of fancy, mulish high step. The Arabian horses frolicked behind. Then came the birds, surrounded by Jabeth and Lizzie and Emmett, with me bringing up the rear. We'd all spruced ourselves up and donned our cleanest and best duds. I figured we'd worn the trail fairly, er fairly well. But all good things come to an end, and the end was at hand as by and by we reached the open square around the city well. From here on in, Mr. Peace was in charge, he being more of an authority figure than me anyways, you looked at it. He took, to, he took it in good stride, rising from his wagon seat to face the crowd, gathering in all directions, he tipped his hat. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, all good folks of the fine forward city of Denver. He didn't get no further for a while on account of those folks all started in cheering again. It wasn't clear whether it was the good folks or fine forward city of Denver part that set them up so, but as long as they was happy, I was happy. Mr. Peace finally got to start again. As you probably noticed in them broad sheets done up by your very own most excellent Rocky Mountain News, more cheering cut in about then. Mr. Peace had to wave his hat around to calm things down. Anyhow, you noticed. And here we are with the very bird's promise. Nearly 1,000 of the finest turkeys on this here continent or any other walked over 800 miles strictly for your delectation. Delectation. He paused to squint through the noon sun at the flock. And tell me, folks, have you ever seen a handsomer, healthier set of birds in your entire lives? Of course not. I joined in the cheering at that point. Ain't never been a better bunch of birds anywhere. Mr. Peace grinned up a storm, then finally got down to business. Glad we're agreed. Now, what do I hear for each head of turkey? What am I? Bid. A buck ahead, somebody shouted. Sir! Bidwell Peace turned down right sorrowful. Sir, a mere dollar for these birds would have crossed countless rivers, would have crossed the vast entire great American prairie for these birds that took on wild Indians and the complete U.S. cavalry, not to mention turkey rustlers. No, sir, these birds has got a history to go with them. You set your teeth into one of these birds and you'll be swallowing the entire westward movement. Two bucks ahead, yelled somebody else. When I paid near two bucks a bean for coffee only yesterday in your very shops... Bidwell Peace's voice changed to scorn. Come, come. We're talking 30 to 40 pounds of luscious meat. Mr. Peace went on that way for a while. The price rose slowly. Mighty slowly. By nickels and dimes. Meantime, I'm standing there sweating in the heat, wondering if this auction idea of mine had been a sound one after all. Wondering if I'd been a tad anticipatory in my $5 price. Sweating even more, thinking on what, ha what was to happen if I didn't get that price considering all the percentages I'd been promising left and right. Then somebody finally yells out the magic word. Five dollars a bird. I ran a dripping sleeve across my dripping brow. At last, I looked at Mr. Peace to make it a done deal. But Mr. Peace, he just stood up there on that wagon, waving his arms and talking a blue streak of nonsense. And the price goes up to five and a quarter. Then to five and a half. I'm sweating up a river about now. How far could Bidwell Peace truly go? I hear 550. I got 550. Who's chugging along with a steam locomotive? Or he's chugging along like a steam locomotive. Who will go 575? You, sir? I've got 575. I'm bid 575. Who will go six bucks ahead for the most incredible turkeys on the face of this earth? The crowd finally still. Mr. Peace searched every face in it. He built the silence. At last, he singled out a little fellow sitting on the railing at the end of the block of buildings to one side of the square. 
A fellow smaller than Mr. Peace himself perched so he could elevate himself to see above the crowds. You, sir, Amos Quinn, if I'm not mistaken, are you not the proprietor of the fine provision store where I purchased those fine coffee beans but yesterday morning? Those beans worth every cent I paid? He waited for the week nine. Of course you are. Now think, Mr. Amos Quinn. Think what you can do with a flock of nearly 1,000 turkeys in this great turkey-hungry city of Denver. The little man pulled at the collar, tightened around his skinny neck. He swallowed once or twice. A high squeak came forth. Six dollars. That's my limit. So, Mr. Peace never got a chance to finish the end of the word. The word that was meant to change my entire future. That was because the Central Overland California and Pike Peak Express Company chose that moment to barrel through the crowd, the stagecoach's team of horses frothing at the bit. It's the stage from St. Joe, someone shouted. You forgot about it. it's being due. Watch out for the turkeys. Watch out for the turkeys, indeed. In another instant, my flock was about to be stomped flat into the ground, destroyed before my very eyes. They couldn't fly as there was no place to fly to, hemmed in as they already was by the crowd in the wagon. Being at the rear of the birds, I did all that I could do. I was fa I faced them frothing beasts, jumped right between the first set of harnesses, and wrestled all the lead horses to a halt about a yard in front of my worked-up birds. Next, I glared up at the driver. Just rounded the corner, boy, he stared to apologize. Didn't expect no celebration here. By that time, the door of the stage had sprung open. Out leaped a figure that I'd been trying hard to forget. It was followed by another one I'd have been hoping never to set eyes on again. Pa, I gasped. Cleaver. Pa was wearing a hat, which he never did. He was also carrying a revolver, which he shot into the air to get some attention. Not that he needed any more of that. Next, he swept off the hat to give me a mocking bow. Hadn't intended ever speaking to that man again, but I couldn't help it. The sight he'd revealed before my eyes was that unusual. He was clipped bald as an egg. What happened to your fine head of hair, Pa? Scalped. I've been scalped. Or as near to it as ever, compliments of your peaceful engines before Cleaver and me escaped again. Fine sense of humor they had. Pa clamped the hat back down over his shaved head and pushed away Pushed his way through the turkeys, waving that pistol around. Out of my way. I'm here to claim these birds as mine. Cleaver, also shorn like a sheep, followed. He was holding two revolvers, one in each hand. Any negotiating to be done gets done through us. Why? Why? I spluttered. I turned to the good folks at Denver and appeal. My words flowed out. Why, these is the self-same turkey rustlers that been dogging us every step of the journey. Twice already, they tried to steal my birds. The boy's a liar, Paul yelled. It's the other ways around. Heads turned between the newcomers and me, beginning to wonder. I only stood there. My heart sunk about as low as it could sink. Luckily, other members of my enterprise was thinking more clear-headed. Emmett, the fastest, abandoned his precious flock long enough to leap straight up Cleaver's chest and bite into his nose. Emmett got himself a good grip. He hung there by the teeth for dear life. Cleaver had to drop his guns to pound at him, but it didn't seem to have no effect. Meanwhile, Jabeth and Lizzie had disappeared into the rear of the wagon, in a moment, they were out again, each claiming a rifle, each aiming a rifle at Paul. Slowly, the crowd decided to take sides. Ma, why, that's ugly, nasty man beating up on that poor little dog so. I'm not certain, Emily, sweetheart, but I intend to put a stop to it. I watched the lady march through the center of my flock and bash Cleaver over his shiny pate with a parcel. Cleaver sank to the earth, Emmett still attached to his nose. Then, there we all stood, the good people of that forward city of Denver watching wide-eyed while my facilitators kept their weapons aimed steady at Paw and Cleaver. It looked to be another one of them standoff situations until Mr. Peace blinked and spoke up again. Well now, he swiped at his forehead, well now, it seems like some explanations is due you good people. But first off, we'll have to give you proof of our entire good faith, especially to Mr. Amos Quinn here, who's just about to buy himself almost a thousand turkeys. Mr. Peace stared over to where Mr. Quinn had been last seen. Seemed like he tried to make an escape from his commitments because he was kicking and squirming in the hands of three good-natured louts. Still interested, Mr. Quinn? Mr. Peace asked. The louts grinned and shook him a few times. Amos Quinn managed to pipe up, Proof, if you give me proof of legal ownership. Bidwell Peace turned to me. Come on up, Simon, son. Let's straighten this out. My birds and the people both opened a path before me so I could clamber up on the wagon seat. There I sat down and methodically unlaced and removed my right boot. I pulled at the lining and poked underneath for what I hoped to have ha hoped to heaven was still there. It was. I looked up. Right here, Mr. Peace. Further fishing brought forth a somewhat malodorous square of paper. 
I undid the folds one by one to flourish a full-size sheet. The writing had gone a little weak, but it was still there, thank goodness. I read it out slowly and carefully. Sold to Simon Green this 15th day of June, 1860. 1,000 bronze turkeys. I looked straight out at the listening throng. Signed, Uriah Buffy of Union, Missouri. I sighed with relief as I turned to Mr. Peace. Miss Rogers made me do that up. She sure and certain knew her business for a lady school teacher. Mr. Peace patted my shoulder. She sure and certain did, son. He squinted over the heads of the crowd at Amos Quinn. Will that do, sir? Mr. Quinn nodded again and this time numbly. numbly. All right then, Bidwell Peace yelled. Sold! His nearly new black hat hit the dirt of the square. Sold to Mr. Amos Quinn of Quinn's Provisions and General Steer nearly 1,000 bronze turkeys at $6 the head. A moment of awed silence was followed by another cheer. This one, the most raucous of them all. I paid no attention whatsoever as the cheerful crowd manhandled Paul and Cleaver off, the den off to the Denver jail for disturbing the peace, leaving Emmett behind to lick his chops. I edged off the wagon and sank down right there in the middle of my gobbling flock. Me, Simon Green, I was a rich man. We was back at our old camp overlooking Denver by early evening. It was a lot more quiet without nearly a thousand birds rustling around in the grass, settling up their nests. But not as quiet as all that. Emmett trotted up and plunked himself down in my lap. I scratched where he liked it. Reckon he's come to say thank you, Simon. I glanced up at Mr. Peace. How do you figure that? You saw how he near went crazy when Amos Quinn started taking off with the turkeys. Mighty nice of you to save a few for Emmett to look after. I kept scratching the dog. I'd been thinking of Emmett a little at that point, but of me too, about how birds and me always got along so well. It suddenly had seemed a shame to end this relationship. I only kept but the three toms and three, 30 hens, Mr. Peace, and I don't know how long Emmett will get to the shepherd, how long Emmett will get to shepherd them. Bidwell Peace leaned back into his bedroll next to the fire. To the other side, Lizzie was just about finished polishing the dishes. She'd taken to the job real industrious. That was after I presented her with the wedding day daguerreotype of her parents that I'd stashed away in the corn for this last evening together. Jabeth was sprawled out next to me, blowing softly on that flute instrument of hers. It was a peaceful scene. Everybody's sort of busy with their thoughts, yet comfortable with each other. That shepherding comment, Mr. Peace hugged off his hat and laid it down for the night. What you mean by that, Simon? I took in a breath and it sort of caught in my throat. I mean in that the money's been all shared out, fair and square, and Miss Rogers' piece has been put aside. All them percentages you came on the walk for has been dealt with. And? Mr. Peace drawled. And that means come morning you'll be heading off to make your new life, Mr. Peace, the way you planned. I looked around the circle of fire and Jabeth, he'll be free freer than ever to start up his new life. I stopped at Lizzie. Like I said, we'd been comfortable with each other for the last hundred miles, but there hadn't been any more of those meetings behind the wagon, so there hadn't really been anything said about any kind of future for her or us. And Lizzie will probably want to settle down in Denver for the civilization. Why don't you let Lizzie speak for herself? She said. She suddenly shot out, eyes flashing. Me too, for that matter, Mr. Peace reached behind his head. He hefted the sack of gold coins, that was his share of the great turkey walk. Then he tossed it over to me. What's this? I caught it, already almost knowing. My share of your next enterprise, Simon, if you'll have an old wreck like me around. On a permanent basis? My eyes widened through the night. As permanent as the good Lord chooses, son. But, but, another sack caught me in the ribs. I turned to Jabeth Rubin. I want a part two, Simon. Count me in. Lizzie didn't toss her sack, which was much smaller, but was meant to be a help nevertheless. She walked it over and put it in my hands. Tell me about your new enterprise, Simon, please. Well, first I laughed, then I had to swipe at my eyes. Finally, I started talking, staring into the flames of the fire on account of I wasn't able to face their true affection head on just yet. I stopped in at the land office this afternoon. They got these claim clubs for ranchers, ranches too. And the land we just finished walking through weren't bad at all for a little cattle grazing or turkey raising either. And it's all available. Thousands of acres of it. 